I'm very passionate about policing. I still believe in what the police do. These people are doing their job. They're trying to do their job. They're trying to keep you and I safe. Positive policing and supporting the police give them the opportunity to undertake the job. Three men take Tucker and Rolf, for whatever reason, are taken out and executed in a Range Rover out in Retterdam, which is in deepest, darkest Essex. And it was alleged that the two officers were um, corrupt. She honestly believed, I mean, she collapsed, bless her heart, but she honestly believed that her son's head had been chopped off. You've, you've got to have motivation. And if your motivation is to smoke a joint and then go and spend the rest of the day playing on your PlayStation, okay, that's your own personal choice, but don't expect me to subscribe to supporting you in that. Without, without having a, a center, Without having a community, there is there is no community. Is that what enticed you? What the drugs? No. <laughs> <laughs>
a sex offender. It was a, it was a full on prank. And then the phone call came on to say that we were going to have, we were all going to go to this incident. I turn up, the SIO sits there. He says, oh, Mr. Maleri. Yes, sir. He said, I know your father. Yes, sir. He said, uh, can you cook? I'm thinking, what's that got to do with anything? Can I cook? I said, I can cook. So he said, okay, I want 20 breakfasts. And I had to cook 20 breakfasts for the inquiry team. <sighs> okay. And on the Friday, they'd give me money. I'd have to go up to the local Sainsbury's. I'd buy a bottle of whiskey and a load of cigars. And that's how they'd finish the week. You know, so it's a now... Thank God, it's a completely different world. But that's how that's how it was in the early days. What breakfast did you have to cook? Full one, a full English, a full English, full English with twenty people. <laughs> so we've got a lot of American viewers who may not be aware of the ingredients in a full <laughs> English. What's what's in that? Real sausages, not the American sausages. <laughs> Real bacon, not the American bacon. Uh, fried eggs, black pudding. They don't know what that is. They won't know that is it. <laughs> Pig's blood and sawdust. Um, <laughs> baked beans, toast, you name it. They had the whole lot and I had to cook for 20 people. Wow. Would you say that because law enforcement was in your DNA, you had realistic assumptions or were you idealistic when you joined? Um, I knew what was happening. I knew what the world was about. I'd been around as well. You know, I'd worked on building sites, but I knew what law enforcement was about. Um, yeah, I, I, I had no preconceived. I had preconceived ideas. I, you know, I wasn't assuming anything. I knew, I knew what it was about, and I, there was a welcome because I came from that policing background. Um, I was, was working with people that had, had been in the police with my dad, so it sort of paved the way for me to a certain degree. And going on the CID was always gonna, you know, I was always going to be a detective. There's quite a lot of police in the Freemasons. Did that apply to your family and you? Yeah, and I am a Freemason. You are a Freemason. Yeah, you can ask ask away. You know, I've got I've got no nothing to hide. No, I'm a pretty poor one. I'm not actually a <laughs> member of any any lodge at the moment. But um, you're going to ask me, was there any any corruption, or did I ever encounter any favouritism? Well, James was asking about corruption. What was your corruption question? Yeah, if there's any corruption, bribery, if there is. It's well investigated. Okay, the, the the police service run a really good anti-corruption units now, and and when I say good, technology has now moved into the favour of the police. Yeah, so that so if there is corruption, then nine times out of ten the police are on it. And and I have experienced it. I've been present when corrupt officers have been dealt with, and rightfully so. You know, you can't have one rule for one and one for the other, I'm afraid. That's a bit draconian, but um, that's how it goes. Would you say that Masonic officers advance faster than non-Masonic? Not a chance. <laughs> Not a chance. I have didn't do me any favours. That's, that's, you know, didn't do any of my friends any favours. It's got, do you know what? You've got this um, idea that Masonic movement, the Catholic Guild, all these different things. Absolutely not. I never benefited one iota from it, and I'm not as aware, not aware of anybody else that did either. Did you have to do any bizarre ceremonies or learn any secret handshakes? Of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to divulge them here. <laughs> it's, a, it's a society with secrets. It's not a secret society. And... What you've got to remember is the Masonic movement goes back hundreds of years, and the sanctity of that is because of the history. If you, do you like history? Oh, I'm fascinated by history. Are you a Mason? Edward, no, I'm not a Mason. Edward Gibbons, The Rise and, what is it, Fall and Decline of the Roman Empire is one of my favorite books. Is it? Yeah. Well, if you like history, the Masonic movement is all about history. Okay, that's what it is, and it's about helping your fellow man. But that's no different to any other club that you're a member of. If you're a member of a golf club, you will go to the electrician in the golf club. If you're a member of the Masons, you may go to the electrician who's a member of the Masons. Nothing more, nothing less. Why do you think there are so many conspiracy theories about Masons? Because what people don't know, they make up. So you've, you've probably experienced it in your life. People have preconceived ideas about what actually happens behind closed doors, what your life is about. They don't. They make assumptions before they actually speak to the person, and that's why there are these conspiracy theories. 
I see. Okay, so in 1987, you met your first murderer. What was that case about? So um, I was in the custody suite at Braintree. Now, you've got to remember Braintree Police Station is a very, or the old police station was very, very old, archaic, in fact. Um, man gets brought into custody, and he wanted rabbit, and his wife prepared him chicken. He flipped, and he killed her. That was my first, the first murderer that I ever met. Had he shown any warning signs leading up to that? Oh, listen, you're talking about a different era. <laughs> <laughs> there was there was no um, uh, intelligence system was completely different. There was no domestic violence register. There was nothing like that. This you're talking about. Was this 1987? Was it Thatcher, Thatcher, yuppies, the crash, stock market well, crash? But you are talking about those things, you know, Ford Fiestas, Ford, you know. Cocaine Charlies and all that X, stuff. XR2s, Charlies. Yeah. the prodigy hadn't even been thought of at that point, I don't think. So, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a different, <laughs> it was a different era. Yeah, yeah. So you arrived then, and what is the scene like for this murder? I didn't go to the scene on that one. Okay. No, 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 no. He got brought into custody. That's my first murderer that I ever met. Yeah. Okay. Were you um, interrogating him? No. I was literally, I was literally the the new boy in the station, and it's right. Go and stand with this man, and I had to go and meet and greet this old boy. He's probably dead now himself, and meet and greet him. He gets booked into, the, and then you had to stand outside the cell and keep a keep a watch on him so that you know he didn't harm himself or anything like that. But you're talking about a toilet. You're talking about a a, a cell where the toilet seat's made out of wood and there's porcelain. You know, it's a wooden bench in there. You've got a cast iron door, or a heavy set door um, with a little peep hole. You know, it's a real tiled walls. Completely different, completely different era. So a couple of weeks ago, I interviewed a serial killer from prison. He phoned in from prison. Wow. Killed over 50 people. His criminal profiler was also in a conference with him. And the criminal profile, like, makes friends with these people and gets them to reveal where more bodies are so yeah. families can have closures and stuff like that. So this guy was like a jolly, the serial killer was like a jolly fellow, cracking jokes, likes to go on his holidays. He was a truck driver, had a girlfriend, lived a completely normal life. But when he was driving his truck around, if a sex worker approached and she was rude, he'd say, go away. If she wouldn't go away, say, get in, snap her neck throw in the back wow he, he did that over 50 times and he only got caught because he ended up doing it in front of someone and that someone had sex with the corpse and the dna was found that guy was arrested and he gave up the killer but my question is talking to this guy he's just like he was just like a normal person the profiler said serial killers aren't like what you see in the movies they're just normal people they live in normal lives but they do this thing What's your experience and interpretation of killers? So, yeah, you're quite right. Some of them are charming people. If 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 you if if you can imagine that some people have done it in a, in a fit of passion, fit of peak, you know, where they've um, stabbed their partner during a domestic violence. Some are pure evil, and their evilness has been. This isn't the first time they've been evil. It might be the first time they've killed somebody, but it's not the first time that they've actually been evil. Um, but but some of them are very matter of fact, you know, put a pillow across their face, um, you know, all the all those types of things, you know. And but but I find them fascinating. I I really do find I find crime fascinating. Full stop. You know, why does somebody steal a pint of milk? Why do they take the hubcap off of a a Ford Capri, whatever it was, which was the first case that I actually dealt with. But I find them fascinating. And and yes, they are evil because they've killed somebody. But I've previously said, it's not my job to hate somebody. My job at that point was to find out the truth and what had gone on and provide the facts to the SIO, the uh, Crown Prosecution Service, whoever it may be. But you've got to remember, I was a, I was a detective constable. I was a worker ant. A major investigation team comprises of so many different people from the SIO all the way down, inquiry teams, um, exhibit teams, forensic recovery, family liaison job. I mean, that is an awful job to do, and I did that for a number of years. That's, that's a terrible job, but it's a necessary part of the role. 
So if you're watching this, want to hear that serial killer phone call, I'll try to remember to put it in the description box. If I don't, it's serial killer phone call. Delmas Colvin is the guy's name, it's, uh, if you want to search that. So you're saying that there's a variety of killers then? Yeah. It, some are cool, calm, collected, some crimes of passion. There's a whole range. But you've got to remember that it is the taking of a person's life, whatever way you look at it. So a murder is a murder is a murder. It's just the, the different technique that is used. And, you know, it's some of them are absolutely brutal. They're all, you know, they've all got a, a, a cold side to it. Taking somebody's life is absolutely outrageous. But, um, you know, it, it is fascinating. And it is, it's been going on for hundreds of years, thousands of years. Yeah, I met some crime of passion guys in prison. And they were very well behaved and completely remorseful. And they lived normal lives, had a business, wife, kids, came home one day, wife is in the bed with the pool cleaner, grabs his gun, bam, bam, both dead, just like that. Yeah. Yeah. Just snaps. And 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 the ramifications of that your your life changes completely. So it's not only about it's about your kids' lives, the whole thing. So when there's a family unit involved, it just has a massive impact on them. So did you get to the point where you were interrogating murderers? Yeah. And what kind of insane uh, stories have you got from from those people? Like, how how did they try and mislead you and trick you? And I think I think the the most frustrating part is obviously somebody's got you've got the right to silence, haven't you? So they'll sit there and they'll be all very quiet and they won't say a word. And then as you leave, you know, for, and then they'll engage you in conversation as you as you walk out. They start talking to you, but they know that their lawyer will be sitting there and telling them to say absolutely nothing. And then as you walk out, they'll start to engage you. But there's there's been all sorts, you know. There's been some real. Um, I think that I think the one the most frustrating. I, I interviewed a man called Stuart Campbell, who's still locked up um, for the murder of Danielle Jones. Her body's never been found, and I would for them, and that, and that, this is the frustrating thing. For the, he's been found guilty. He's been in in prison since I think two thousand and one. There or thereabouts. For them, they need to know where the where the body is, where the, their daughter is, so that they can have full closure. Um, that's one that's really, you know, really sticks in my mind. Could you explain that case then, how her murder came about and what what happened there? Well, she she was um, murdered by her uncle, and for months and months, it was one of the biggest cases in the UK at that time. You know, a, a missing teenager, uh, pictures of her in all the media. Fantastic family, fantastic coverage. Um, and technology's moved on. You know, o over the years, the way that in the police do their investigations, it's moved on. And um, if I remember rightly, they, they used um, telephone data and all the other things, the, the forensic data and what have you. And he was subsequent, subsequently convicted of her murder. Uh, Is he denying it then? Yeah, well, he's saying, yeah, he's always pleaded his innocence. But of course, 20 years on, he's still languishing in, in prison. Um, Isn't there an incentive for him to admit guilt and show remorse so he can get out? Yeah, and I'm, but I'm not sure that it's applicable. I haven't looked it out because I haven't kept up to speed with it, but I know that they were looking at the um, some changes around that, and I'm not sure it's applicable to his particular case. Right. What are the most heinous murders you've heard of? Uh, well, there was a lady who was decapitated. I... Uh, Walking down the road. Walking down the road. Walking down the road. She was oh, uh, that mentally ill person who was supposed to be. No, it's her husband. Her husband oh, decided man. that he was going to kill her in the street outside the school, and um, he decapitated her in the street. That was that was quite a grim. What was occurrence. his motive? It was, it was a jealousy. She, uh, they'd split up, if I remember rightly. They'd split up, and she wouldn't have him back. And if if he couldn't have her, then nobody else was going to. And why outside of a school? She just dropped the kids off. It was a, it was a pinch point. She he knew where she'd be at a particular time. He'd gone and purchased the weapon, sharpened it up, gone along and, 
and took her head off. A pinch point. Is that law enforcement? Well, no, it just, it was, um, a, it, no, not, not. I like that pinch point. Yeah, but that's where he knew she was going to yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, yeah, that, that was, pr that's a, a grim event. They're all grim. They're all, they're all, they're all awful. Yeah. All right. So going back then, so you've joined. I will the, tell you one more though. Yeah, go for it, please. Um, <laughs> so there was a man by the name of Justin Chant who was um, starved. And this is horrendous. He was starved to death by uh, a group of people. That was absolutely awful. You know, he, starved his to death. family, yeah, his family, he was held captive and he was starved to death. Who held him captive? I can't remember the guy's name now. And what was the motive behind that? Just bullying. Bullying? Just, it was pure bullying. That was one of the things that they undertook, but it was pure bullying. Was that within his family that he got? No, 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 no. He'd, he'd been brought in by, this guy was almost cult-like. I've forgotten his name, the guy responsible. But yeah, it was almost cult-like. And as an inquiry team, everything affects you you know but you've got but we've all got a, uh the police have got a unique humor they have got a unique humor you know i make no apologies just like for prisoners do it's yeah, gallows, exactly. gallows humor. exactly yeah. exactly you know yeah. but and but deep down it, it affects you every post-mortem that you go to you know the the, the sounds the smells the well, take us through your first post-mortem my first post-mortem wasn't a murder victim it was a stroke victim and um, every pr probationer, somebody within the first two years, has to go to a a, a, a post mortem, and the sound of the the saw, which is used to remove the cranium, um, the smells in in there, it's it's something I could talk you through every post mortem that I've ever been to. They're horrendous, but Christmas Eve, standing next to somebody's body whilst they're having a you know, and you're talking about what's going to happen the next day, you know, for, for your Christmas. It's not normal. How long does that take to solve a cranium? Oh, not long. They, they're, they're pretty quick. <sighs> and how long does a whole post-mortem take? Well, that depends. If it's a, if it's a home office pathologist, it can take hours. Um, and it all depends on what they're going to do. So they might remove all the skin. They might take out the testicles. Have to watch that. Yeah. So every, I know. Tell me about it. So, so, but the th but the thing is, uh, behind all of these victims is a family. Yeah. You know, and they're they're nearest and dearest are going through. They're, they're going through this procedure, which is awful. But if they don't undertake the procedure, how on earth are we ever going to find out how they died? How their nearest and dearest died? So if it's not obvious the cause of death, is the procedure more invasive then? They have to go yeah. everywhere. And and what the, yeah, well, they do anyway. They do anyway, but it could be, um, they'll take the brain and they'll send it off to another pathologist who's, who's got an expertise in, in that. Um, they'll send off slides to different people to see what the, someone's eaten. And there's there's a whole host of processes that have to take place. And watching the autopsy then, does it just suddenly become apparent at a moment sometimes that this is this is how this person died or does it, all the tests have to come in? Sometimes. So, for instance, we had one case where um, the victim died in a, in a fire or we believed he died. In a, a gay male, um, previously lived abroad, comes back for whatever reason, and I, I can't recall why, um, this guy kills him well we thought he died in a house fire but when they did the post-mortem they found that the bone here the hyoid, hyoid it, like it, epstein had been snapped well there's only one way that's going to happen is because of strangulation and at that point um we then you know the bosses declared it as a murder yeah that's why the uh theories about epstein because it appears that to to have that injury hanging isn't enough you got to have that Maybe a cable around the neck or something. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, going back then to... Oh, I had another question, actually, from something you just said. How often does the occult and Satanism come up in crimes? It's not something that I've had a lot of dealings with, to be fair. I'll tell you what does come up when you have a missing person 
the amount of um, mediums that contact you, <laughs> you, you know, uh, and and if they were all right, then we'd have bodies all over the place. You know, it's just, <laughs> it, it is, uh, but the occult and something like that. That said, you know, I, I can, can't say it ne it's never happened, but it's not something that I've really experienced. Yeah. Um, any any mediums that were that hit the spot or no. never? <laughs> if they did, <laughs> they'd, chance? Have, they'd have chosen my lottery tickets last <laughs> night. If they had. All right, so you joined in 1986. What was the training like? Well, I, I enjoyed it. If I'm honest with you, you know, spent all this time in deepest, darkest Kent. Um, I'd never been so fit. The food was awful. Uh, you'd spend any money that you have got going to the local Chinese to top up. Um, you weren't allowed in the bar for the first half of your course. I can't remember how many weeks we did. Was it very 14? physical? Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't think of it looking at me now, but um, yeah, it was very. I mean, it was freezing cold when I was down there. We got snowed in, but it was brilliant. You know, it was, but that's what built your camaraderie. You were, you were thrown into a group of people that, yeah, we had people that were carried the gun at you know the Devon Gunners and all those sorts of things with the Royal Navy we we had all sorts of walks of life and then you had this 21 year old who spent his life working for his with his grandfather and with my, my parents at a garden center um you know we all came from very different diverse backgrounds but it was fantastic they don't do regional police um training colleges anymore unfortunately but did you get any firearms training no I wasn't firearms Trunction training? Yeah, of course I had trunks. So I had a trunction when I first joined. I had a, the, the wooden, I think the Americans call it the billy club. But, um, <laughs> but then we moved on to the ASP, which is an extendable baton, um, CS spray. But no. As part of your training, do you have to be exposed to the spray? Yeah. How was that? Well, I wouldn't recommend it. Let's put it that way. It's not, it's not the best feeling in the world. It was a prison, a jail or a house riot. And they came in with the chemical. It was like a fire extinguisher sized canister of it. And it just, all the snot comes oh, out and all awful. your eyes just start running. And then well, I had an old timer cellmate and he's like, just wrap a wet towel around your head and blink and blink. And it'll get that shit out your eyes. Yeah, no, it's not, it's not good. I would, like I say, I wouldn't recommend it, but yeah, no, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. It was, um, that was part of, part of life. If you wanted to be in the police service. Would you say that people join the police who joined the police? I've got a bit of an adrenaline um, affinity for adrenaline spikes. Like like the robbers have an affinity for adrenaline spikes. You say um, there's, there's a similarity there. There is adrenaline. I mean, we. I'd be lying. You know, when if you're driving at hundred and something of miles an hour down the motorway, you, you know, yeah, your adrenaline does go. And when you're rushing to a job and you've got blue lights on, but. Yeah, of course it is. And I think people do, they join initially to do that. And who wouldn't? Who who wouldn't want to take part? Why did I join? Um, I joined because there was stability to start off with. That's why I joined the police service. You know, I watched my grandfather, like I say, picking out the cat crap out of the, the sand and taking the ice off the water baths. Did I want to be doing that when I was nearly 70? No, of course I didn't. And the fact is, at that time, you got housing allowance, you got boot allowance, the girls got stocking allowance. I mean, that was fantastic. Um, so it was a, you know, it was a completely different generation. And this was when they had like beat cups and stuff like that. When you saw the police officers. Walking around. Yeah. In fairness, I mean, a lot of forces still have that, but, but because of the... Uh, the cuts in the austerity that's taken place, they've sold so much of the family silver, they're never ever going to recover back to where they were. And actually, as a, as a rate payer, you do want to see, you know, you may not, even the people that don't want to see the coppers walking around actually do. They actually want to have that peace of mind that they're going to have a local police officer that's going to deal with their neighborly disputes or the dog crapping on the sidewalk or whatever it may be. So, yeah. So after your training, which police station were you out of? Braintree to start off with. Braintree. And what was your first assignments there? Um, my first arrest, I was off duty. Okay. I passed out in, um, passing out is where you f have your final parade. 
Okay. So I passed out on Maundy Thursday, which for the American viewers is the day that the Queen gives a coin to every person, or say every person, one coin to for however many people were on the she's been on the throne. For however many years she's been on the throne, she gives them a coin. It's called Maundy Thursday. I passed out on a Maundy Thursday. I didn't get a coin from the Queen. And on the Friday night, Saturday night, I went to a party with my brother and his now wife. And on the way back, we stopped for a kebab in Colchester. And a fight started. And I thought, oh, I remember this. This is criminal damage because they smashed the cabinet, the kebab cabinet. And we ended up having a fight in the middle of the street. And the, when the police turned up, they handcuffed me and I got a clump as well, which turns in years to come, I ended up working with these two guys. Um, but yeah, because they thought I was the protagonist in all of this and I, I had absolutely nothing. And I I've always remember my brother shouting out, leave him alone, he's a copper, he's a copper. So yeah, and they got my warrant card out and that was my first arrest. My first investigation was the theft of a set of hubcaps off of a uh, Ford Capri. And the gentleman responsible took them and put them on his Ford Capri less than a quarter of a mile. Oh, yeah, but you see, you, what you got to remember? Criminal genius. Well, but we, no disrespect, but we, <laughs> only, we only catch the stupid ones. We only catch the, <laughs> they only catch the ones that want to over-egg it, they want to make more money out of it. You know, if, if people kept it simple, the police wouldn't be quite as prolific when it comes to arrests. Well, look That's how not a tip, by the way. Look how hard it was to catch Escobar. Well, they didn't even catch him in the end. He died, didn't well, he? Well, yeah. Um, so as you're going on these assignments then, is it meeting your expectations, the job? Are you happy with the work? Yeah. I, yeah, I think my first 15 years, absolutely brilliant. But I think you get to this point, and, and it's different now because they work a lot longer. But I, I'd got to the point at 15 years in, I had two young boys. Um, and I wanted to leave, but I was pension trapped at that point, which is a nice thing now, but at that time, but no, it always met my expectations. Um, yeah, listen, we all have disappointments. Of course we do. But, um, yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed. Well, when was the first time you got attacked? Oh, quite early on. I mean, early on the worst, and I, I've had a couple of beatings, but the worst one was in a pub on a Sunday during the old Sunday licensing. And we went into this pub, Jack and Jenny pub in Whittam of all places. And um, I was with my colleague, smashing fella. And these three guys are in there, they're drunk. The pubs then, they closed and then they'd open again for the evening session. And guy sitting on the, on the bar stall, I won't name him. And um, the landlord says, uh, I need him to go. He's, we've got, he's got to go. So I said, well, okay. Well, the law is that the landlord has to come round and assist you with the removal of the, the, the person. So he comes round and as he does, he said, right, I want you to go. This guy picks up a glass, goes to the glass, the, the landlord, I get him, put him on the floor, handcuff him. And as I do, I just, I'm hit. I get smashed with a pool cue and it was like a Western and it was us versus you know the pub and you, you used to put up i don't even know what they call it now but you say it was 10 9 which is basically your you need help and suffice to say the i've never been so pleased to see the traffic guys turn up you know they turned up <laughs> in their masses in their lovely new granadas or whatever they were driving at the time and you know we took these guys out and but it's quite it's quite frightening believe me it's really it's quite scary because all the bluff and bluster. I got. I got. Um, well, let's let's finish that. So they got. They ended up getting convicted uh, for assault on police, and they made complaints because you know they'd allegedly been pushed around a little bit. But um, but it is scary because every day, whatever people say, they are putting their lives on the line. You never know what what you're going to. You never know that the, the poor bugger's got mental health. That you're going through his front door. You don't know that he's not going to pick up a knife and attack you. And I was on duty in the office and a um, call comes up, armed robbery had taken place at a post office, gun scene, the whole lot. I tip out, I've got a, a, a kid with me who hadn't been in the police very long. And I said, come on, get in. I said, and if you see a gun, just get out of the way. 
because they'd got involved in a they they, they were going to get involved in high speed chases these fellas and um i parked up car comes off the a12 and i see it i overtake it because it's it's four people in this vehicle so they're a lot heavier i overtake it in this police car and i think if we get into the town the kids are uh, are coming out of school we've got to stop this now so i just literally anchored up and they they rammed me they starburst and all i remember is this one guy he's about six foot four and he pours himself out of the car and i've got an asp at this point and i'm thinking i've got i've got to win this one i've got to win because if i don't win this one i'm dead and he's got his hands going down into his trousers unbeknownst to me he's got 10 grand in cash stuffed down his trousers and i thought he still had the gun with him so i'm hitting him for all i'm worth and you talk about adrenaline rush you i could have hit a golf ball 500 meters with that sort of adrenaline and i am literally unleashing on him and he's still running he's still running we get into a public park and all i can hear because i'm in plain clothes i'm stop hitting him stop hitting it and i'm wellying him as hard as i possibly can and he's getting the, he, he's finally got his hand on the money and he's throwing it up in the air expecting me to stop and pick up the money you know as if that's going to happen but yeah that and but your life flashes before you you really believe that um something untoward's going to happen so earlier you said you know the job provided stability you, did you mean like guaranteed employment and paycheck yeah because on the other end stability the opposite of that is instability the chance you could die at any moment yeah you yeah you could absolutely absolutely i'm gonna cough i'm sorry yeah cough go for it <coughs> um yeah absolutely i mean the, the stability was around housing you know we we got paid well 356 pounds a month in rent allowance then you know you're talking about 30 years ago that was a bloody lot of money to go it's about to a grand today or something like yeah. that. Yeah, well, they don't and they don't get anything now. So, you you know, I was asked about the the corruption element, and I think that there is a risk now because if wages fall much lower, you in order to employ and to get the best person and the most honest person, you have to pay pro proper money. And if they are, if if you don't pay proper money, and they see something or someone says to them, oh, do you know what you can have? You can have this you can have that cheap here's, here's a few quid they're going to start taking the least line of resistance because actually they've still got families to feed they've still got all those things i'm not condoning it by any stretch of the imagination but when you've got staff that are traveling from colchester to harlow 50 odd miles each way and they've got a family and they've got to buy a house and they're earning the square root of nothing that's where your corruption is going to start kicking in it's the same with the prison guards years ago they were all big bad ex-military and now from the guys i interview who've just come out in the uk they say that they're, they're like tesco workers oh yeah earning a pittance yeah and they're just easy to seduce or corrupt or have them bring drugs in or whatever mobile phones drugs yeah all those sorts of things and and you can see how it happens how they fall into this, this thing oh, oh you you talk about that we we had a job where um a Polish gentleman was executed out in Epping Forest. For what reason? He'd crossed his house, basically. So they drove him around the end. They drove him around the road, took him into Epping Forest, and they shot him, allegedly, because nobody was ever found guilty of this. Um, when you interview a handful of Polish people who ordinarily would have had a, a particularly hard time with the police in their own country, to give somebody 24 hours or 36 hours in British police custody is a walk in the park. Mm. You know, you've got all these different factors around it. And the other thing you've got to remember is some sections of society, life is cheap. You know, the, the um, member of the public who stabs his best friend because his best friend says that his sister is a whore. That was a phrase from their own country that was used, it was, you know, derogatory term, but it was a phrase that was used all the time They've had an argument and he's said, you know, I spit on your mother's eye or whatever it may be. He's taken a knife and stabbed him. Yeah, you've got all these different elements within the, that the police have to now deal with. What was the closest you ever came, other than what you've already described, that you thought you might lose your life? Um, I think, 
I think that's probably the worst. I mean, there have been moments where I've been scared. You, during the during the London riots, we got deployed to um, one particular area, and it was calm. You know, we were doing some nice patrols. We're in Camden, nice people. They're happy to see us, have a cup of coffee, all those sorts of things. Then you get called to um, Brixton, where a gun shop has been broken into and all the weapons have been taken and you're getting sent over there on a blue light run. And what starts off as a, everybody's happy, we're all, you know, all eating the sandwiches that the Met have provided us and all those sorts, you know, to, shit, you know what, this is, this is getting real. And not, you know, I had mates who had stood there and their petrol bombs thrown at them and they're standing in fire and all, that's quite unnerving. How does it feel to be in a full riot situation? Is it like Braveheart? Well, touch wood. I've never been in a. I've, I've never been in a full-on level two visors down situation. Yes, I've been in public order patrols where um, EDL or someone like that would put together a protest, and then we'd have to go and uh, go and police that. And there's a lot of pushing and shoving. Um, but it is quite, you know, because it can it can turn on a on a flick of a coin, and and that's you know, it's quite, I say, unnerving. Did they give you training then in handling cultural variations of London? And did you experience or see racism? So I'm glad you asked that question because I think that the police service now work harder than ever before to promote diversity. Okay. Um, when I joined, it was a completely different era. You love thy neighbor only finished about five years before we we before i joined so you, you you know and did i experience racism um yes but was it racism that you would call racism yes it's still racism but it was it was jokes and somebody would have been offended yes and i you know i, I did experience some of that have i experienced anybody that's been treated differently i think i'd like to think that everybody that i've dealt with has been dealt with fairly and with balance well it was everywhere wasn't it i mean i grew up in a predominantly white um northern class uh, northern uh, chemical manufacturing town yeah that was homophobic and racist and all kinds of crazy stuff was just just going on back then i've, I've got friends who are, who are gay and couldn't come out because the response within their peer groups within the police service you know i've, I've got some lovely friends who um, they've been been together thirty odd years, but they could not come out, and that that's that's more than disappointing. That's you know that's disgusting. I've got black friends who have experienced racism, and I think that they're the, probably the better people to speak to because as a white Essex boy, yeah, it was probably going on around me, but I wouldn't have noticed it quite as much as if I was if I was black or I was, or I was from an a ethnic background. But as I say, I'd like to think that everybody I've dealt with as, or had contact with was dealt with with dignity and, and respect because I believe that everyone's got a voice, irrespective of, you know, black, white, green, Chinese, gay, straight. It doesn't, that doesn't phase me at all. I will treat you as the person that I see before me, not because of what you are or who you may be. So you started out in the Colchester area then. Did you move closer towards London over time? I, I finished up at Harlow. Harlow, okay. Harlow. So 70,000 people living in 11 square miles. Diversity is rife. Big Eastern European um, community there. They were bloody hard. You know, the, we, whatever anybody says, you read it all the time on social media. Saw some Eastern Europe. Well, one, how do you know they're Eastern European? Because, you know, they work so hard in order to get money together to give to their families. To And they're so family orientated. But Harlow was a great place to work. Um, I had family there. I've still got family there. It's, so, yes, you're moving closer to London. So I was running um, undercover jobs, drugs, guns, things like that. Um, fascinating. But of course, it moved closer into the London districts because Essex, I don't know if you know, but there's seven tube stations in Essex. Um, you start to border the Metropolitan Police, you're going into Barkingside, right on. So you're starting to pick up all the East London um, areas. You've got Chigwell, you've got all the footballers that live around there. So it's quite a, you've got, oh, this is going to sound awful, but you've got affluence and effluent. You know, and um, at one point I was 
DCI for the area so I'd cover Greys, um, Tilbury, all around there, uh, Epping Forest Districts, Loughton, Chigwell, Harlow, Brentwood. So I had quite an area to cover. But um, yeah, it was it was great. Football hooligans, how did you handle them? Well, I am a lifelong West Ham fan. <laughs> So um, I knew I knew some of the individuals from my previous life. Not that I was a football hooligan. It's just that because I was at West Ham as often as I possibly could go, and uh, so uh, it wasn't something that I had a great deal to do with. I mean, Colchester United and South End, which was where we used to police, they had their own hooligan element. But it was normally when another team came into the area, so they got treated with the same level as everybody else to be fair so the war on drugs gets ramped up yeah and there's a lot more there's like a lot more toys available and, and spending for the police in terms of going down that line of work is that what enticed you what the drugs no <laughs> <laughs> no um no because it was look, like sold wasn't it as you j join the drug squad and you'll be, you know, you'll get this car and this surveillance equipment and you'll be able to do all this. But it was but like a... You see, I never went on the drug squad. Yeah. I was an undercover manager. Okay. So I, I didn't... So I'd have, you know, people that would, would go out on the street. And that's a dangerous role. That is bloody dangerous. You know, you, and good luck to them. They, there's a lot of bad press around the undercover world at the moment. And maybe some of it's right, but you know what? It's not a job that I would have wanted to do. And I've got some mates who have done it, and it's a, that is a bloody tough job. So you manage those people. Yeah. So if those people must have got in some really dangerous situations, yeah. could, any stories you can tell us about that? Well, it's the usual sort of thing. You know, they're, they're buying cocaine, um, or they're buying crack and heroin or, mainly. You know, and that is bloody... You're going into somebody's property, you're buying stuff from them. It's, it's a horrendous job. Um but it's fascinating. They come back and they, they, they'll be doing this for six months to a year. But it's so impactful for the police. You know, again, going back, swinging that old blue lamp. When I joined, cannabis was the, the drug of choice. You know, the, that, was, that was it, really. Yes, all right, there were other drugs, speed and what have you were available. But then... We had the the dance culture started coming in, the raves, that you know, all the other the ecstasy, LSD, all those sorts of things, the death of Leah Betts. You know, it, it's the fight against drugs um, has been going on for years, but never has it been so big. And cost versus reward, you know, there's a lot of money to be made at it. Although I think a lot of people, because of the COVID element, there's not the there's not the ease of the money. I think it's probably pushed the price of the drugs up, but it's not as easy to get it in because there's more uh, of a concentrated effort in the ports and whatever to stop it from coming in. So America spent two trillion on a war on drugs. Um, drugs have become stronger than ever before, e.g., fentanyl. Do you think that the drug war is a waste of taxpayers' money, and we should have heeded the lessons of alcohol prohibition, which led to the mafia taking over? and all the violence and all the bootlegging and all the criminality and all the corruption. So tin hat time, because I think, you know, not, not everyone's going to agree, but I don't think it's a waste of money. I think that um, if you go back to the cannabis element, okay, cannabis doesn't automatically mean that you're going to try ecstasy or any other drug. It doesn't mean that at all. But what it does mean is that, a crime, nine times out of ten, will be committed in order to purchase those drugs, though, that cannabis, okay? Because if you're smoking 15 quid's worth a week and that's coming out of your top line and you're not earning anything and you're just getting your benefits or you're earning a little bit of money elsewhere, you've got to break into a car. You've got to steal a push bike. You've got to, you've got to undertake some level of criminality. I'm not saying everybody, but some level of criminality to buy your gear. So let's move that on because actually those people at the very top very rarely get their hands dirty. Very rarely do they get convicted. Very rarely are they within 20 slots of the actual gear coming over, but they've made a significant investment, an investment that will give them great returns 
to lead a particular lifestyle. Now it's interesting because um, I really like Judge Rinder. I think he's I think he's very good, and he, but he's very vocal around this particular thing where social acceptance with the middle classes of taking cocaine because you've got if you've got barristers and the like saying that this is wrong but you've got another percentage of people because society is society there will be people in all walks of society that will do it but the people that they're either defending or locking up are the same people that are supplying them the gear for their posh dinner parties so in answer to your question no i don't think it's a waste of money i think that there is insufficient eff um, effort around some areas i think that the fact that um, they demean or almost declassify cannabis uh, undermines the actual offence of the Misuse of Drugs Act. Okay, so... Controversial, sorry. So you're talking about acquisitive crime then. So ex-cop uh, Neil Woods, who we've interviewed, people may see that on the True Crime uh, ex-cop playlist. He has said that of all drug users, heroin users are a minuscule fraction of drug users, but... They commit the majority of acquisitive crime, S burglaries, car theft, yeah. shoplifting, all you know, all this stuff. Now, Portugal had over a hundred thousand problematic heroin users. Yeah, they decriminalized, and the users were no longer afraid to speak to the health teams because they knew they weren't going to get arrested. And Portugal got down the, the users down to less than fifty thousand in, in record time. Yeah, what do you think with, about policies like that? Um, I like the idea. What what I'll say is I actually feel for you know homelessness, um, drink and drugs dependency because you are looking at you know the, the people that take heroin their lives are absolutely on the rocks. Many of them were sexually abused as kids. Yeah. And from what we've learned and through these interviews, and th and there's so many social issues wrapped around their lifestyles. Now it's easy to um, it's easy to push somebody out into the cold you know um, but we should we should be helping people i really you know I, I believe that and i think that um heroin is such an insidious drug that the people that are on it need but they need greater sentencing dare i say it for those people that are actually bringing it into the country that those people for that, the traffickers the traffickers there should yeah. be greater um reach across the globe effort to bring those people to justice and to support those people that live in it. I'm I'm a, a I suppose I'm a closet socialist in a lot of ways. I believe that every child should have a meal on the table, that everybody's got a right to national health. Now that will come as a bit of a surprise to some of your American viewers because you know that they, they don't have a national health service. Um and you know that we're privileged from that perspective. I believe we're privileged, but we're underprivileged in other ways because we still have kids going to bed hungry and guess what if you go to a child that's got no food on the table and you say go and sell me this bag of heroin to the local bloke who's sleeping rough and i'll give you a fiver out of the deal they're going to do that because that's the only way they're going to get a mcdonald's on their table and that's where we're lacking as, as society so the leap cops say that if we legalize all drugs the traffickers you're talking about giving big sentences to won't even have that job anymore it's, it takes it out of the hands of the criminals do you agree that that would happen no and i'll tell you why because we still have a clandestine market for alcohol and cigarettes in this country so you'll end up we have counterfeits so you have counterfeit cigarettes all right you'll end up having counterfeit drugs there's still got to be there's still going to be hasn't got to be but there will still be a market for criminality even if we legalize it so that's my view and you know i respect what they say but i don't subscribe to that because we're seeing that the cartels are being hit by weed being legalized and decriminalized in america because that is the most consumed drug in the world so the cartels have lost some of that revenue source mm. we have seen that happen but but the, what comes with that is Cannabis has changed over the past 30 years. You know, when I was a kid at school, there was Lebanese and there was Moroccan, you know, red and black, okay? Now you've got 
cannabis that is so strong. And if we allow that to go on, then what we're going to have is another generation or a generation of people that won't want to get off of work. You've, you've got to have motivation. And if your motivation is to smoke a joint and then go and spend the rest of the day playing on your PlayStation, okay, that's your own personal choice. But don't expect me to subscribe to supporting you in that. It's a bit old-fashioned, as I say. I know I'm going to get a load of abuse for that, but that's, that's how I feel well, about it. It's interesting to hear the other side of what Neil was saying because Neil said that the potency of cannabis is a function of drug laws because if you look at alcohol prohibition people just going out and having a beer and a wine but once it became a black market and the the criminals wanted to get the most bang for the buck so they made the highest concentrated liquor and that's why you're seeing the fentanyl that's why you're seeing the uh the cannabis has become these really super strong strains because the criminals are in charge and they want to get the, the biggest bang for the buck but even in the places where they decriminalise it, they still make the, the potent cannabis. They still do the skunk. So, you know, if you go to Holland, where they're very liberal around the drug use, you could walk into any cafe and, and buy the strongest skunk, which will knock you out for a week. So, yeah, you know what? Everyone's entitled to their opinion, but I don't subscribe to that. All right. So on the drugs squad, you've got, like, people underneath you who are undercover. What? Was the hurriest things that happened to them? Anyone get kidnapped? Anyone died? Anyone? No, they, got, there was got in bad situations. Oh yeah, they got in bad situations. You know, you, where they, you know, they, they'd be in a group of people and they get turned over by the police or whatever it may be because that's the last thing you want. Um, what they're undercover and the cops come in and yeah. don't know they're undercover. Yeah, and then they, yeah well, get, they get beat up. Yeah, but it's not something that you discuss once, yeah. once, you're, yeah. once you're, you're in. You're in. You're, you you work in a very small team. A very small, trustworthy team, and they're fantastic. They do a fantastic job. It's not a masonic handshake they can do to get out of that situation. No, no masonic, <laughs> no masonic hands. <laughs> We're going to have to have a beer about this. Um, <laughs> um, no, I mean, look, it, it, every day is a every day is a difficult day for them. And some of them won't wash for bloody weeks, so they fit in nicely with the, you know, if you go in smelling of. Uh, this, you know, some nice Christian Dior shower gel. <laughs> Someone's going to soon pick up on that, aren't they? You know, yeah. you, you have they have to live their role. So, was that what? When did you go into the CID? Then have I jumped? jumped so I bit? went into the CID. I'd started my plain clothes stuff in eighty nine. Yeah. Then I went on major crime in two thousand. So I did a various, you know, variety of things between eighty nine and two thousand. Worked on divisional CID. Um, worked on major crime investigations and then Essex had the the idea they took it from the Met to build specially designed teams so a team is designed of you've got a senior investigating officer which is a superintendent now deputy uh, deputy SIO office managers um, and then you'd have separate teams so one one office is something like 30 people in there or there were plus the indexes statement readers, um, action managers, allocators, exhibit officers, intelligence cell. So there's quite a lot there. So you got wrapped up in the Rentenden murders when it was alleged that two of your colleagues were involved in the Essex Boys case. Darren Nichols was the source who drove Holmes and Steele to the scene. Holmes and Steele, yeah. Could you set the table for this by explaining what the Rentenden murders and the so Essex boy cases are. Rentenden murders, um, three men are taken out and executed in a Range Rover out in Rentenden, which is in deepest, darkest Essex. Um, it then turns out that um, officers in, in my office were running an informant called Darren Nichols. And Darren Nichols, it transpires, was the man that drove, allegedly drove, Wombs and Steel to Retterden where the three men were murdered. Worms has still been subsequently convicted, um, protesting their innocence, maintaining their innocence, but they've been convicted at the Old Bailey. Um, and it was alleged that the two officers were um, corrupt, going back to the conversation we had earlier on. They stood trial and were found not guilty. You know, they, they, they took the test of 12 good people and they were found not guilty at a subsequent hearing. So that was quite, that was a bit of a, 
a life changing moment for me as a quite stressful, quite stressful to say the least, because the scrutiny that we as a an office went through was quite overwhelming to a point where I think a few of us would have just thrown our hands in because we'd actually we'd done absolutely nothing wrong yet we were subject to the same level of scrutiny as everybody else and it was oh, we got we actually got regs so that you won't understand regulations so you get stuck on to say you're being investigated and they gave that to us on Christmas Eve of that particular year you know Merry Christmas and by the way there's a there's a load of regs which could cost you your job no for well you haven't done anything wrong but yeah, it was just it was a bit of a bit of a sad time really for for us and for Essex Police. Excuse me, and for Essex Police. What was the motive for the Rensenden murders, and what were the backgrounds of the victims? Um, my belief, and this is only my belief, but it was all drug related. Um, three men, Tate, Tucker, and Rolf, for whatever reason, um, Mick Steele and Jack Wombs shot them in the back of the Range Rover. It's well documented, uh, well publicised, and uh, yeah. Have you watched the movie Rise of the Foot Soldier? No. I think I saw it in that. Yeah, it's, it's all to do with that and the Essex boys and all that. I, I'm a bit rubbish when it comes to police dramas or anything like that. The, the case I was talking about earlier on, Danielle Jones, when Stuart Campbell subsequently convicted, Panorama... I think it's Panorama, one of the BBC did a did a program on it. And um, all of a sudden, my voice came on. And we were sitting eating t our tea uh, on our laps, watching it on TV. I was like, that's my voice. That's my voice. And they used my interviews in order to open the program up. So, But I, I, don't watch, I don't watch anything like that, to be honest. So there was a situation at the mortuary where they went to see their relative and asked for a photo with the body. Yeah. So, How does uh, that work? So, uh, crime of passion. Well, loosely, um, gent was having an affair with a, allegedly having an affair with a woman. Her husband wasn't very happy and they strangled him and threw him in a ditch. So, I'm a family, li family liaison officer and we go to, they do the post mortem and we go to the mortuary so that the family, because they're from overseas, they want to see the body of their nearest and dearest, their cousin. So, okay. So we tip up there and um, he's uh, in the mortuary room about this size, actually. Uh, purple shroud pulled up to his neck and one of them said, this is my cousin. So I said, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. He said, uh, can we have a photograph? I think, well, this is a little bit, a little bit odd. So I phoned up the, um, the coroner. I said, look. We asked about you asked about diversity earlier on, you know, and this isn't something that you can train anyone. So I phoned up and said, "Look, this is what the request is," and she said, "Yeah, not a problem." So I think there's fourteen of them, and they're all standing around the body, giving it a big thumbs up, and oh yeah, and it was just part, but just part of their culture. Quite normal in Transylvania. Well, allegedly, <laughs> yeah. So you took a parent to see her son at the mortuary where the procedure had taken place. The stitches were visible. She thought that the person responsible for his death had chopped his, chopped head, his head off. I mean, that was awful. So can you imagine you're, you're taking, you're driving the, uh, a family to see their nearest and dearest who's, who's died. As it happens, he, this was a tragic accident. He would come out of a pub, fallen over, banged his head on the no. curb and, and died. Was but he then, inebriated? Yeah, he was. And he was with a group of other people and they thought that he'd been killed by them and all that sort of stuff oh. anyway so it's the hottest day of the year i've got four people in a ford fiesta with no air con i've got a grieving mother you can Im you can just imagine it can't you? it's absolutely awful we go in there and where they've undertaken the the post-mortem procedure you can still see the si stitches and they she honestly believed i mean she collapsed bless her heart but she honestly believed that her son's head had been chopped off oh because the the, the um, blanket hadn't been pulled up high enough up, up around the neck. Yeah. Yeah. So that you know that's quite a. This is what I'm saying. These are the memories that you never ever. I've got I've got dozens like this, or you know dozens of of where I've been to post mortems, but you they never leave you. I remember the first person, I, first fatal road collision I ever went to. 
And I hadn't been in the police very long, and this man had fallen in the road, and as he knelt up, a taxi came along and decapitated him. Ooh. And it was like um, it was like the top of an egg had come, oh. had come off. And I remember that. And I got back to my police house, and there was a car parked in my drive, and I ne nearly lost my shit because I couldn't get up to park my car. You know, they're the sorts of things. And, and I'm one of 100,000 plus. There's 89,000 members of National Association of Retired Police Officers in the UK. They've all got stories like this. They've all seen different things. And, you know, some of them are bloody unpleasant. Did you ever get sent to a house or a location whereby you did not know what you were getting into and you discovered a corpse? Um, yes. Uh, well, the, the thing about um, those types of calls, there's normally a clue. There's normally a clue that you're going to find somebody inside. So you could turn up to a house in the middle of June and there'll be a thousand blue bottles parked up on the, on the inside of the glass. Um, or, you know, the mail's piled up. The mail's piled up or somebody's Milk been bottles. missing. I had a lady had been, they hadn't seen her for months and where she decomposed, her body started to drip through the, through the sea. You know, so, drip through the sea. So those sorts of things. But you've not, there's normally a clue there. So there's none of them a real, a real surprise. I, had, I did have a lady that um, we got sent to thinking that she'd passed away. We turn up, I break in, uh, go, and go down in there and... Um, feel for a pulse i can't feel anything so okay fine yeah i call up uh, yeah a uh, lady here she's dead and she sits bolt upright she goes i'm not dead I'm like, <laughs> scared the life out of me but um but yeah you normally you normally get you normally get a clue that there's something not going to be right and do you have to take precautions for your schnoz in a situation like that yeah smelling salts so or put well i mean no i mean that's you just you can't walk around with smelling salts. It's, at the end of the day, you go in and hold your breath and hope to God that you can hold it long enough to get back out before you have really? to take the next one. Really? What you actually do, you find, you sort of almost internally clamp your nose and breathe through your mouth. It's quite... Um, oh, that takes it away. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Oh, some of it. And you, you feel sick. And sometimes it sticks to you. The smell sticks to your clothes. Yeah, it's quite putrid. Were there any situations that made you physically hurl? Um, someone else being sick, believe it or not. That's what makes me feel sick. Everything else is just, you know, just get on with it. But somebody else being sick, a drunk being sick at the side of the road, mate, would make me feel sick. How tricky is it to handle drunks? Oh, it depends. I mean, you, you can get friendly drunks and you get violent drunks. The problem is with a violent drunk, they put themselves at risk as well as everybody else. So, yeah, alcohol has a strange effect on people. You could drink, you might be a whiskey drinker, you could drink a bottle, you'll feel fine. I might have a couple of glasses and I want to fight the world. You know, so everybody's different when it comes to alcohol. Have you got people who are like, they want to fight the world and then they're in the cells and the next day they can't even remember what they did? Shaking your hand and saying sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah you'd have that. You'd have your regular drunks. You'd have your, fam you know, your domestic violent drunks. You, I joined at an era where domestic violence wasn't a, an issue. It was an issue, but it wasn't investigated to the same level that it is now. It's not dealt with with the same level of compassion that it is now. It's fantastic that people can feel safe, irrespective of whether you're heterosexual, gay, whatever it is. You, you've now got the ability to go to the police and say. I've been assaulted by my partner. Yes, there are some malicious allegations. Of course, there are that you're going to get that in every every walk of life. But the police deal with that in a far better way than they ever did. So the, the, the person you mentioned earlier who died of starvation, is that the one who was barricaded in the cupboard? Yeah. How long does it take to die of starvation? God. Horrendous. They say you can go so many days without water and then... So many I think I sent you a copy food. of the press cutting, didn't I? The, yeah. the, 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 the shot. I mean, the fact is that he was put in there and locked in a cupboard and died. Jesus. God knows how long that took him, poor bugger. So how come you ended up in Perth, Western Australia? Well, um, we had a, um, a rape in a sexual assault in Braintree. So here's the story. I've been to Marbella for the weekend to go visit a friend. I'm driving back and I saw 
a search team out in the street near where about a mile and a half from where I live. So I said to my wife, I'm going to phone in and find out. So I phoned up and the boss said, do you want to come in? We're short of staff. So I went in on my annual leave day, went in, um, and we identified that this person had been, he's been convicted and he's probably out now. He's one person who probably wouldn't want to see me again, but, um, the girl's been attacked and we do some digging, find out that he is a, an Australian national, um, or British national who moved to Australia when he was a kid. He then, he's then come back to the UK. But when we do some checks on him, there's some outstanding inquiries in relation to him out in Australia, which meant that we went out to Perth, four of us. Very nice it was too. But an office is an office. It doesn't matter where you go. Um, you could be anywhere in the world. You've travelled. You know, if you're doing whatever job you're doing, an office is an office. A recording studio is a recording studio. It's just got different people in it. A beer is a beer, you know, at the end of the day. So, yeah, it, it was a. I had some great experiences. I met some fantastic people as well. I've done, I've done things that people would pay money to do. Yeah, you know, and and it has led to some privileges. You know, make no mistake. I've done some. I've done some great things that if I hadn't been in the police, they probably wouldn't have been. Uh, they wouldn't have opened the door. Australian High Commission. You probably know this. But they did the Gringotts Bank scene of Harry Potter there. Now that's got nothing to do with the crimes. But but as a, a history buff and and to go into these different places, I'm a volunteer at the Tower of London on a Tuesday. You know all these different things. They're, they're, it's I do see it as a very privileged. So when you got to Australia, what did you actually do there? So we had to go with our colleagues from the Western Australian Police to take statements off of people out there who had known the suspect whilst he'd lived out there to try and build a course of conduct and and what have you. So that's what we did there. But the legislation is such that whilst we can read and write, we're not able to take the statements. So these poor souls from Western Australian Police, absolutely brilliant bunch of people, um, they took the statements on our behalf. So we'd gone out there to to monitor. What am I going to monitor? They, they know what they're doing. I can imagine there was a bit of banter with the Aussie cops. They're brilliant. They are absolutely brilliant. Is big, it, big drinkers are? They like a beer. Yeah, they like a beer. They they treat us well. We went on the river cruise and we did some fantastic things with them, yeah. So then you went over to the FBI lab at Quantico so, with, with a lone pubic hair. Yeah, so this is quite sad actually because um, a nine-year-old girl uh, was sexually assaulted and on the inside of her underwear was a single pubic hair. And we took that pubic hair, checked it. DNA comes back as with the suspect. Um, then there's some dispute as to how she got that in her underwear. So we didn't have an expert in the UK at that time who could do around fiber transference and how far a, a hair would travel. I don't have to worry about it, but how far a hair would travel if there was, you know, if it got into the wind, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there was a guy out there who was fascinating guy you know absolutely brilliant but you think oh fbi this is going to be you know it is it is absolutely brilliant when you turn up at the gates and you've got the scene from um oh what's the the, the film with silence of the lambs silence of the lambs you've got the sign from silence of the lambs you go in there they've got a, a, a mock-up of, of a city or a town and they've got a mock-up of the cinema where dillinger met his last breath and they've got all these different so they could practice dealing with armed robberies and what have you i went into the uh, ballistics lab they've got a they've got every type of gun you can imagine they've got replica the replica of the rifle that was used to assassinate kennedy they had the real one is locked away but they used it so they could get the trajectory and all those sorts of things and there i am holding the guns used by dillinger um pretty boy floyd all these different fantastic people and you go and see all these things but i'm sitting opposite a scientist that's what you know he is a true scientist and he's such a brilliant brilliant man anyway we go to trial they test the the hair there's you know the, the scientists said there's no doubt that this couldn't have been transferred any other way than personal contact the kid gets found not guilty because um the jury accepted that the underwear that this child was wearing um, where she was assaulted was in an, in an area where this suspect 
had previously urinated whilst fishing and they found him not guilty. Oh dear. But on an upside, he went out within two days, committed a robbery and got locked up for five years. Okay, karma. Karma indeed. Yeah. So at the FBI lab, did you get to shoot any guns? No. Oh. <laughs> did you put a request in? <laughs> you know, that would have been absolutely brilliant. They, I mean, they've got They've got a range there. It's absolutely, it's fantastic. It's state of the art. Um, but no, we didn't get a chance there. Have you shot guns? Yes. Well, what, how did that come about? Well, that came about because um, I, I'm quite a sociable sort of person and um, I'm a bit of a networker. And we built a really strong network with one of the local RAF bases. And they invited us up there to have a look at the in-flight refuelers. We go up there and they said, right, we're going to take you to the range now. And they gave us 50 rounds. And a, a nine millimeter gun, and we stood there <laughs> using it. So yes, and I've, I have got guns as well. Yeah, yeah. You've got guns now, presently. Yeah. And you're allowed to have guns. I guess. Yeah. I thought. Guns, oh, guns no, were... only shotgun. Only shotgun. only a shotgun. Only shotgun. Yeah, Are you but... a farmer or something. <laughs> no, it, 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 the, everything dies of old age, and it'll it'll die of rust. But I've yeah. got I've got it. Got it. Well, how do you have a gun in a country where guns are illegal? Well. It's a, shotguns are, are legal. Shotguns are legal. Shotguns are legal. It's only the automatic weapons and the other types of guns that were used in Dunblane. When when Dunblane sadly took place, they changed the legislation around guns. I, I had this conversation with Americans all the time because we do a lot of work now with um, different American former law enforcement, private eyes, things like that. They don't they don't understand any of this, but. Guns are effectively banned. You can have a hunting rifle, you can shoot deer, you can do your clay pigeon shooting, shoot game, stuff like that, but you cannot have automatic weapons or handguns or, or the like. So, so in America, then, you can just go into a shop and buy a gun, a shotgun, for example. If shotguns are legal in this country, what's the procedure to get one? So to, to get one here, you apply for your certificate, it goes through the chief constable, they do some medical checks on it, make sure that you you know you haven't got any issues, and then you'll get a, you'll get a shot, shotgun certificate. It is as simple as that. It costs you about I don't know fifty sixty quid now for a five. So year. criminal records, mental health records, you're going to get excluded from that. Yeah, I mean if you've got convictions of a particular type and you served a particular length of service, I used to know all this. Um, you you'll get excluded from having a shotgun. Um, but yeah, I've got yeah I've got shotgun. How prevalent is gun ownership in this country then? Is it a very small amount? I don't think it's prevalent. I don't think it's that prevalent. There are yes, I live in the country. I don't shoot anything, but I've got a gun. You know, I go clay shoot clays. The difference between here and the USA is if the police happen to arrive at the scene of a crime and somebody presents a firearm, then the chances are that that firearm is going to be illegally held. So it could be you know, a, a rifle or a handgun or something like that. The police know immediately what they're dealing with. The police in the USA, you can turn up. Everybody's got a right to bear arms. Therefore, how do you differentiate between a good guy and a bad guy? You know, and that's the thing. So, so look, you could go within five miles of here, walk into a pub, and there'll be somebody who will be able to get you a gun. There is of that. There is no doubt. You can. There is a market for everything. But the fact is that that gun will be illegally held. And as I say, at the States, you can just walk into a shop and buy it off the street. Which system do you prefer? Ours. By Ours. You think, by that, far. you think that's safer? Mm, by far. Absolutely by far. Look, knife crime is terrible. You could go and buy it. Uh, well, we, we had it. We had a, a, a gentleman went and bought a knife in TK Maxx and killed his wife and son. You can, you can buy a knife. You could take a knife out of your drawer. But we are so good with our gun laws here. Shotguns, they're all locked away. You have to make sure everything's done properly. Um, we have got a far better system, a far safer system for everybody. What are your thoughts on these high-profile cases of people who've got guns and shot cops? There was the guy, what was it, Raoul Moat? And there was one in Manchester that shot a female cop, Two. didn't he? Two. Yeah. What are your thoughts on those cases? Oh. I'm a little bit draconian when it comes to that. Mm. I mean, I, I, do I believe in the death penalty? Yeah, for some cases I do, where, it, where it's literally beyond reasonable doubt. That's really controversial, um, but I make no apologies because actually um, I'm very passionate about policing. I still believe in what the police do. I, I've met people from all walks of life, and to take any life is absolutely outrageous. 
but these people are doing their job they're trying to do their job they're trying to keep you and i safe and yeah i'm quite happy to debate the death penalty aspect because obviously once you've killed someone there's nothing there's no coming back and somebody has to do that but yeah i've got very strong views around it what about knife crime in london do you have any answers to that yeah, I do believe that we should get off of the fence around what the actual cause is around knife crime in London. I think that we we are, as a nation, pussyfooting around. This is... Every racist says that they've got a black friend, don't they? Every Oh, yeah, I've got a black friend, a black friend. I've got black friends. I'm not racist. I'm a nothingist. If my son was walking down the street and he got searched, irrespective of his colour, sexuality, whatever, if he if he was searched in order to prevent him from being hurt or him from hurting somebody else, that should happen all day long. Really, again, that's really controversial, but I, do you know what? When I, I worked... Um, Comments are going to be going crazy on this video over our uh, debates. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they are, but y y you, know, you know... That's what we want, stimulate a healthy debate. I'm, 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 up, for, I'm up for debate. I know they're going to think I'm a... I'm a you know, racist, sexist, whatever it is, but I'm not, I'm far from it. But I believe that everybody who carries a knife should be dealt with, irrespective of where they come from, they should be dealt with with the appropriate sanction of the law be because it's too easy to kill someone. What about root causes then, the government shutting down youth centres and stuff like that? Hang their heads in shame. Community is everything, okay? So, but this isn't only a government, well, it is a government thing because the austerity issues have withdrawn the funding for policing, for social care, for all the things that we believe in. Without, without having a, a centre, without having a community, there is, there is no community. Go back and swing that old blue lamp again. Community policing started when you had houses in the community, police houses in the community, all right? Where you lived... Where I lived, I lived in a police house. Everybody knew that's where the coppers were. Sometimes they'd be put in socially deprived areas to make sure that there was some maintenance kept around. But everybody knew it was there. Yeah, the, there was a street nearby where I grew up that was a lot of police. It was police housing, yeah. 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 You'd have vi village bobbies. The moment you take that away, you are ripping the heart out of the community because actually that is the focal point. The good, the bad, the ugly, that is the focal point for community. And... A lot of these issues, I believe in supporting kids. As I said earlier on, I really do believe in that. Um, I'll go into schools. I'll, I'll help them do their CVs. I'll do whatever I've got to do because I believe. I don't want kids to go to prison. I don't want to go. I don't want my colleagues to go to any mother and tell them that their son has been murdered or that their son has been arrested for that murder that the 14-year-old child that's laying in the mortuary waiting to undergo the horrendous post-mortem has been killed by the 14-year-old who lived two streets away because of a dodgy drugs deal or he owed him 300 quid or whatever it may be. But the problem is that the, the societies where it's happening, the black-on-black -black societies, because this is where, look, that's, that's the fact. That's where the majority of the cases are. That's where the help is required. But help comes in different formats. So it comes from the community. It comes from positive policing and supporting the police. Give them the opportunity to undertake the job because you'll have people that will watch this now who may have been to prison, may hate the police, but do they want their kids to either be a victim or a suspect in one of these? No, they don't. So in America, there's this thing called like the school to prison pipeline. So you take away the youth centers, show them all these videos that glamorizes crime. And then, you know, they think it's cool and end up in a private prison where they're making contracts in the tens of billions a year right now for these private prisons. Got prison guards unions and all these contractors lobbying, you know, to tighten laws and lengthen sentences. What do you think about the mass incarceration in America in the private prisons? One in a hundred adults right now is in prison in America, mostly because of low-level drug offences? The, the, their problems are different to ours. I will say that for a start. Um, I think their, their social deprivation is overwhelming in some areas. And you, it's a real... Look, we have it here. We have the haves and the have-nots. 
Um, I think we're more socially aware here than, than they are in the States, in some parts of the States. Um, it is outrageous that the, the prisons are seen as a money-making exercise. That, that, that should never, ever be the case. But then I would say the same about the hospital system. And where does it stop? Does it then become a private policing so that the only people that can afford a police service are the ones with the money in their pocket? Mm. And therefore, the socially deprived areas, it'll be like purge. They'll just get on with their own stuff. They'll be sorting out their own problems. Like the Hunger Games eventually. Yeah. yeah. And that, that can't be right. Mm -mm. So you retired in December 2016. That's quite recent. Yeah. Probably out of all the ex-cops of interviewed, that's the most recent. Do you have PTSD, flashbacks, nightmares? No. I had my memories. Um, I think it's brought about you realize your mortality when you're dealing with all these types of things and you start to... No, I don't, I don't have a PTSD. I do know, I have friends who do and I, you know, I understand why they do. Um, there's only so many fatal road collisions and those poor buggers, you know, speak to a traffic man. They're going there, those people are still alive in the car. You know, and they're doing all they can to make sure that they stay alive and then... So, you know... You, have you been on the scene when they're still alive? Have I? Yeah. Well, I have, um, but actually I was off duty. I, I witnessed the fatal road collision. Bloke got mopped up by a taxi outside a nightclub. I'd only been in the police for a few weeks. But do I have PTSD? No. How, do I seek solace in a bottle of, bottle of whiskey? No, not anymore. How do they give you anything like to deal with mental health to when you go through extreme scenarios of people with the guts hanging out and dying and things like that? They've now, they've now introduced a, a, a system where as a family liaison officer, because that's quite stressful. You're sitting in a room with a family who a bereaved family and they're, they're lovely. You know, the majority of them are absolutely lovely. Um, and that's really stressful. And, and because of the frequency of the deployment, it could be that you'd have to be debriefed and, and they would, welfare would give you a load of support around that. But I, I would, I can honestly say, and I don't know about other parts, but they're not brilliant at looking after the mental well-being of it. The, they will say they are. They'll have some social media campaign, you know, well, we're doing this and we're doing that. But the fact is that I know a number of people that are just left to languish, and it's sad. So experiencing death firsthand for so many years, does that give you an appreciation of life and the yeah. miracle of existence? Yeah. I cry every time I speak to my grandson out in Australia. Oh, you know, I can't get to see him. He was born in December. Every time I see him on um, Zoom or Portal, whatever it is, yeah, I do. I get very emotional because the sanctity of, and I've got another grandchild being born this week. The sanctity of life is massive. Here am I saying I believe in the death sentence for certain cases, but the sanctity of life is so important and make the absolute most. We're privileged. We've made it this far. There'll be people that won't have made it to, I'm 56 next birthday. They won't have made it 56. You know, so I remember going to a murder, going to a mortuary, and my friend had just died of leukemia, and he was in the same mortuary. He was a policeman. Lovely, lovely man. And that, you know, that's quite um, sobering. Yeah, my sister's little baby had leukemia, but they saved her, and that was... Uh... A sobering situation yeah. for the whole family. So it's like you've been forced to become a stoic philosopher whereby you, you know, perhaps see people complain about little things and think, if only you knew the value of what you've got. Get on with it. Yeah, yeah. I would be, if I commented on everything that I just want to say, shut up on, on Facebook, <laughs> I'd be doing that all day long. You know, it's, I think, Former coppers are great because most of them like to engage. They like to talk to people. They're very forward-facing, customer-focused and all that. But they're also very cynical. And, you know, they they just want to say to people, just, you know, just just realize how lucky you are. Um, the fact that you've still got your Sky TV, you've still got everything else that goes with it. Yeah, you're having a terrible time. But you know what? There's people who are having a really bad time. Going around and arresting somebody, right, from a from a, a nice background, nice house, and you're breaking that mother's heart. 
you know, and that mother doesn't want to know what their son or daughter has done. But the fact is, we're intruding in their lives, we're searching their houses, we're doing all these different things. I'm not only talking about death, but, you know, everything. So if you can go unscathed in life and never have to experience all those, you're bloody lucky. Going back to something you said earlier then, um, hypothetically speaking, you've got a kid who kills another kid in London, life crime. Is it the role of the police to inform the family of the deceased? Yeah. Did you ever have to do that? All the time. All the time. And you just show up and say, look. Hello there. Can I come in? And you know, I mean, oh, I had one. It was terrible. They know right away. that There's like a look on their faces. Well, unless they're being arrested, why did the old bill turn up around okay. the house? So you're in uniform, are you? No, I was, I mean, there was not, no. I had did it. I did have to do it. Oh, I'll start again. I, I had to do it in uniform. I remember the first one I had to do was a, a chap who died whilst diving in Portsmouth Harbour. And he, he died and I had to go around and tell his son. And that was really sad, you know, Sunday evening going around there and, and telling him, you know, really sorry, mate, but your, your dad's died in his mid forties or whatever. Um, so they just go into shock when you tell them. Yeah. You know, is there any, have you got any neighbors? Um, can I make you a cup of tea? But you have to walk away, you know? So with some of these people, they haven't got any neighbors. Their nearest and dearest is, you know, in, in the Northeast or wherever it may be. You've got to, you walk in, you deliver the bad news, um, and you walk out again, out of their lives. And the next time you see them might be at a coroner's inquest if, it's, if it goes that way. I remember telling one family on Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. Yeah, that we found the body of their mum. That was awful. And that will stay with me for the rest of my life. But it will stay with them for even longer. On those uh, duties then, what was the youngest person you have had to inform the family that did but die? Um, not particularly young, sort of early 20s, something like that. Did you do anything arresting paedophiles? Um, no, I have. No, that never sort of came into my my remit, if I'm honest. What about rapists? Yeah. You got you put a few rapists away? Yeah. Well, they're going to love that in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it's um, the, the, the problem is the judiciary, and it's well, it's well documented. You've got time for this. You got Yeah, keep going. It's well documented that the amount of people that go to court for rape that actually get convicted or the amount of people that it's dis disproportionate. And it's, I think that, it, you know, how, how do you encourage victims to come forward? Um, and how do you elicit the evidence in order to make it a credible prosecution to get people to, to be, you know, and so it's a very, very difficult situation, but yes, I have. What do you think cases like, I watched this thing on Netflix, I think it was, Sins of My Father. Never seen it. It's a Catholic priest and he's got like hundreds of victims. Some of them are babies and they just bring in these really high priced lawyers and he's in and out in no time, and they're just moving him to another area. Yeah. What do you think about that versus, I went to the Hemp Museum in uh, Amsterdam, and on the wall there it said under three strikes laws in America, for weed possession there's people doing 25 to life, which costs the taxpayers millions. But that's disproportionate to the offence, isn't it? You know, yeah. and we've all, we've all got a view around sex offenders in, within the church, whatever the church may be. Um, the problem you've got is that there's a... Um, The, the culture around religion is that the priest or whoever it may be can't possibly have done that because why would why would you as a child tell on because they've, they've been the most trusted person now they need to get over that they need to break down that barrier before they can because not every priest is a pedophile not every and and I I'm pleased to see that the churches are actually coming out against child sex offences, I think. But there's more that they could do as a, as a group, massively. It's just, I don't know. It, it's a real difficult situation. We've learned through our interviews that there are paedophiles who join the priesthood now knowing they'll have that legal protection from the high-priced yeah. lawyers. And that just, that can't be right. I mean, but the, the problem is, in this country, so um, position of trust, okay, which is what we're talking about, Everything else is covered apart from private tuition, 
private um, sports coaches. None of that. So all these people that have direct contact, continual contact with young people, there is no legislation wrapped around that element to protect them. Yeah, it's 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 not right by by any stretch of imagination. And it does need to be dealt with and dealt with properly. And the police and the authorities are, I think they're getting better at it. I think I think the dark web. I don't know a great deal about it, but you know, there's a massive market there um, for all types of illicit substances, guns, sex, whatever it may be. But I think the police are getting better at infiltrating, and so they should. Do you think then there are some people who are above the law, and I'm talking the Epstein case, and the public and the viewers of these videos absolutely demanding that Prince Andrew should speak to the authorities and possibly be investigated himself? Um, are they above the law? No, they're not above the law, but are they out of reach. I think that's the that's the difference. I think having having the opportunity to lean through and put your hand on their shoulder and pull them in to have a chat. Um, I mean, I don't know sufficient about either case, but um, I mean, there's some very serious allegations made um, by Virginia Guffrey that she was sexually trafficked to Prince Andrew in London, and also that he participated in, let's just say, activity. On an island that involved um, East European girls who were underage, and if that's the case, then he needs to, you know, he needs to be spoken to. At the end of the day, um, I think, and you know, putting the measure in around that, you've got the issues around the, the the boy that was killed by the American diplomat's wife here. You know, so it's 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 two way traffic, and so we trade Andrew for her. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know you know what I don't I don't know that sufficient about that that case. Um, but anyone else with, the, with such serious allegations would have been like SWAT team raided or something and be quite, facing a very long period. Quite of, potentially, yeah. In prison, yeah. So it seems as a in imbalance there. Uh, but as I say, without without reading it and understanding it completely, but the issue you've got is, I know this is hypothetical, but you know somebody's brought here. The age of consent is sixteen here. Age consent in the states is eighteen in some states, twenty one others. You, was it Rob Lowe got convicted out out there of? Um, oh yeah, I think it was. Yeah. Was it something something like that? But yeah. you know, so what is law in one country isn't law in others. So there's a whole different types of, you know, whole different areas to to look at. But as I say, you've got to look at it from both perspectives. You've got a, a diplomat that's killed a a child, a boy on a motorcycle, and not going to come back. And face any form of court hearing. So, what is it you do now? Uh, well, up until about two hours ago, <laughs> um, <laughs> I run a recruitment company for former police officers and military personnel. Wow! So we do everything from what's that called? Ex job. Ex job. So if you're in the job, if you're in the police, you're in the job. When you retire, you're ex job. Um, and we set it up three years ago, and we do services so if you've got your own business you can advertise with us for pennies a month um and if you're looking for work we try and find you work so we do everything from covid marshalling drivers right the way through to middle east contracts so would you like us to put a link in the box below this video for people to reach out to x job is that is that possible yeah we can put whatever links you want we can yeah, put whatever cool. contact information yeah. you want are you on the socials or anything like that socials linkedin the whole lot well, you send us the links over and we will sure put them down there yeah, then. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. Thank you. Is there anything you would like to say in conclusion to the people watching this video? No, I'd just like to say thank you very much for, for listening to the rants of a 56-year-old balding, graying <laughs> man who can't get his hair cut properly or his beard <laughs> trimmed properly. Um, no, I've thoroughly enjoyed ex the experience today. I'd just like to say thank you. Thank you to the guys. Um, and if, you know, I'm quite happy to go into open debate with people I'm quite happy to have polite conversations. Well, well, there will be a debate below this video in the comments if you want to join that. I'm sure there will be. And there'll be a premiere as well, whereby it is shown for the first time. And as we're speaking, they're debating what we're speaking live. Really? Yeah, yeah, I'll send you a link to that <laughs> yeah, too. Yeah, cool, cool. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm a nothingist, as, a, as I say, but I do believe that 
the the elephant in in the room in certain cases has to be thrown out. And what's your preferred method of people contacting you? Uh, emails fine, social media is not a problem. Okay, so huge thank you to Paul for coming on and Joe and James for filming this today. Uh, huge thank you to you guys for watching this for the past two hours. Please let us know in the comments what you think. If you want to debate Paul, perhaps he may be down there responding to what you said because I know some of the things, some of the subject area we've roamed over today is going to trigger some people and they're going to get, they're going to get really active in, in the comments there. Brilliant. Um, huge thank you to all the new subscribers. Subscription logo is in the bottom corner of the screen. And huge thank you to people who've gone down the description box and clicked on all of our other links, playlists, socials, donation links, etc. So to stay in the, the rules of the law, we're going to do an elbow uh, bump, is it? Cheers. Yeah, right. Thank you very much. Thank you.